Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Chatham House corporate members event on the political economy of the European Union after COVID-19. Over the past six months, we've seen an unprecedented level of state involvement in the economy as governments put large parts of their economies into something like induced comas due to the lockdowns required to deal with COVID-19. They started paying wage bills for millions of workers, guaranteeing loans to many businesses, and in all, the role of the, of the state in the economy has at least temporarily fundamentally changed and become much larger. This has in turn raised questions for what the economic settlement will be and should be after the pandemic. Will electorates and, for instance, demand a continued stronger role for the state and in particular, will they demand more protective states? Will we see shifts towards more active industrial policy as governments attempts to increase their resilience to shocks like COVID-19 and attempt to reduce reliance on overseas productions? And will they start to um, deal with the kind of inequalities, that often already existing inequalities that were highlighted by the pandemic, as we saw those already in the most precarious forms of employment, for instance, bearing the brunt of the economic impact. Looking specifically at Europe, there are questions about what this means for European integration as well. Uh, no, now that we have the economic data coming in for the first two quarters, it's increasingly clear that there's been a large divergence in economic outcomes between European countries with, unfortunately, the uh, economic outcomes lining up with existing fault lines within the EU. The southern economy is struggling more, seeing larger declines in output, and those that were already stronger in the north doing better. We discuss these topics tonight with two fantastic speakers. First, we have Dr. Julie Smith, who's a a reader in European politics at Cambridge University and a member of the House of Lords, and possibly even more important, a former head of the Europe program here at Chatham House. Um, although I guess as a current fellow of that program, I might be a bit biased. And uh, we're also joined by uh, Sylvain Poirier, who is the chief EMEA economist at S&P Global Ratings, and who also teaches at uh, Paris Dauphine University. Um, so given how these issues really at the intersection of politics and economics, I think we have the perfect panel for a really good discussion on this. And I therefore also very much look forward to the questions from the audience, as we want to make this as interactive as possible. Please put your questions in the Q&A box for that. Uh, that's where we'll be looking. And um, if you so wish, we will open up the floor as well for you to ask your questions, at least over audio, uh, so we can turn this into a bit more of a discussion. Uh, which just leads me to remind you that tonight's event is on the record and that a re recording of it will be made available on the private YouTube channel uh, for Chatham House's corporate members. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, hand the, the digital floor to Julie uh, for her introductory remarks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, this is a first for me. I have spoken many times at Chatham House and as Papen said, I used to run the European programme. And in those days, it was always very easy. You walked down a few steps with the speakers and everything was set up. You could see the, the audience. You knew exactly what you were likely to expect. And you usually recognized a few faces. So there was that sense of, I know where I am and I know my audience. I've never actually done um, a speaking event via Zoom or Skype or anything else, despite being an academic. I've done various seminars with my students, but it's a little bit different. So if any of this feels strange, if I'm speaking too fast or too slow, I do apologize. Um, I've had a bit of experience doing the House of Lords remotely. And that is a very strange experience indeed, because you get no sense of feedback. Um, and obviously, if you're speaking, you really want to know what do people think. So again, perhaps put in chat if you think that I've gone off topic or that I'm going on too long. But the challenges of COVID, it is slightly strange to be speaking as a British participant in this panel, talking about COVID and the European Union. When I ran the European programme, there was no question about Britain's membership of the European Union. It's so long ago that it was never in question and we just assumed that Britain was part of Europe and so the responses and reactions would have been part of a single whole. Now of course we're looking from one side of the channel 
an Anglo-Saxon set of responses versus perhaps an EU27 set of responses or a European, a, a European Union response. And I think that is one of the things that is worth thinking about. The extent to which the European Union has been, managed to respond to this crisis as a united European Union versus responding as a series of member states. And I want to talk a little bit about crises and the way various crises have interacted, but also the way the European Union has historically dealt with crises, because I think we're beginning to see something in 2020, which if you support European integration, if you want ever closer union, is beginning to look a little bit more positive perhaps than the immediate responses to crises in the past. So if I say the European Union, I'm really talking about the institutions versus the responses of the member states. But obviously, as we've already heard, we've got the COVID crisis very much coming in the wake of a whole series of crises, the Eurozone crisis and the refugee crisis in particular. And those two crises very much were mutually reinforcing that the same countries that were being worst affected by the Eurozone crisis then found they were bearing the brunt of the refugee crisis. And the odd thing was that in the United Kingdom, the responses to those two crises, which didn't really affect the UK very much, were used during the Brexit referendum by leavers to say, look at the European Union, look at how badly it treats the people of Southern Europe. There's no solidarity. Look at the youth unemployment. And it was a very powerful narrative that was used both by Lexiteers, those on the left who wanted more solidarity. And as a narrative from them, it was perhaps understandable. But it was also used by right-wing Brexiteers who threw it back to say, huh, look, Europe's not very good at solidarity. You speak a language of a united Europe, but maybe that's not how you're acting and reacting. And I think initially, over the last 10 or 12 years, there was a sense that maybe responses to crises were dealt with nationally rather than by the European Union as a whole. And if you go back to the 1970s, there was something very similar just after the UK joined, when we had the Middle East crisis, instead of having a European response, there were lots of different national responses. But what we've seen with the COVID crisis, I think, is a response from European countries individually and the European Union as a whole that has been a little bit more effective and a bit faster than we've seen in previous crises. We obviously have asymmetric effects of the COVID crisis. And initially it looked very much as if the countries that were going to be worst hit were exactly those that had been worst hit by the Eurozone crisis. But if Italy was the first country in Europe really to suffer, we've also seen Italy being a country that has actually managed to respond to the crisis very effectively. And I think one of the success stories is precisely how Italy came back from the first wave and is now actually able to function very effectively. Spain perhaps hasn't managed quite as effectively, but nevertheless, the disasters that perhaps could have arisen haven't arisen or haven't, haven't turned out to be as bad as they might have been. But we saw initially asymmetric impacts. And if you looked at the impact in Germany in terms of health outcomes, then it did look really very different. But we also immediately saw two quite different responses from Angela Merkel and Ursula von der Leyen. And I think it's quite noticeable that you've got two German politicians. Von der Leyen had been Merkel's defence minister, come from the same party, and yet their immediate reactions to the COVID crisis were a little bit different. Because von der Leyen, as commission president, suddenly says, we need a big response. We need a response of all of us, not a response of 27 different states. And Angela Merkel rightly pointed out that in fact, 
this was a health issue and health is not a European competence. And that is hugely important because one of the key issues for the European Union is can it respond if it doesn't have competence? Clearly the member states collectively can get together and say, we wish to respond, we wish to act. There's nothing to stop them doing that. But if the European Commission wants to create an initiative without having a competence to do it, it can be very difficult. And if in addition it's saying, and we need the resources to be able to deliver on our initiative, it can't do that without the political will of the member states. And I think that ambition that was already in March outlined by von der Leyen and the caution expressed by Angela Merkel saying, this isn't a European competence, were both important. But obviously a health crisis has also become an economic crisis in many ways. The huge economic impacts, potential for major cuts to economies, mass unemployment, offset partially by much greater spending and budget deficits in all the member states, then creates a new dynamic because economics is precisely a European competence, at which point the European Union does have a role. So the interplay between those two issues, I think, is important. And the positive aspect of the COVID crisis has been the way the European Union has been able to respond economically, which is obviously going to be the thrust of Sylvan's discussion. So I won't encroach on that. But the next aspect then, and where I'm going to wrap up after my seven minutes, is a suggestion that if the European Union really wants to be able to respond to health crises, then we do need some institutional reform. There does need to be some structural reform. Is that possible? Is it likely? It is possible if the political will is there. But at the moment, the driver on the member state side, or the twin drivers, are still France and Germany, led by Merkel and Macron. If they stayed in office for the next decade, I'd be quite sanguine. But if, when Angela Merkel stands down, there is a change in the governments of Germany, everything could change. And if Macron isn't successful, if the way Europe is responding leaves too many people feeling left behind and the inequalities caused by the COVID crisis, both across the European Union and within France, led to a backlash, then we could see a very different sort of Europe. And that is magnified right across the European Union, that we could, in a positive scenario, see the responses to this crisis leading to a more integrated Europe. The alternative is the rise of populism and European disintegration and frustration. And I will, t I will draw to a close there. Thank you very much. Uh... That was really interesting. Um, uh, we'll move it on then to uh, Sylvain, who will discuss the uh, economic side a bit more uh, after just having heard the political side of the debate. Thank you very much. Um, Jean, not sure we'll focus only on the economy, especially to uh, after uh, such a, a, a political speech by, by Julie, which uh, I, I, and I share a lot of, um, of things um, is what I've been uh, said. But uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for offering me the opportunity to speak in, in such a prestigious place, even in digital form, uh, with a very esteemed panelist. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure for me. Maybe one, one um, uh, uh, point of the disclaimer uh, before I start. If uh, I'm reliant on German digital infrastructure to be with you today, uh, so if there is an issue with my internet connection, uh, apologize for that. Um, so now, th th there is no doubt um, that the involvement of the states in the European economies will remain stronger after COVID uh, than they were before. And, and this, in many respects, we will have or we will see more public investment uh, with the European Recovery Fund and possibly an overhaul of the European fiscal rules. We will see probably more state participation, possibly as a way out to uh, 
repay or not repay uh, for the loan guarantees provided uh, to the uh, corporates, um, European corporates during COVID, and also to fill the gap in European equity, which is a problem. Uh, we will probably also see more uh, or, or more permanent income support to households or companies. Think about, uh, for instance, what Spain decided on, uh, on minimum income. Um, and perhaps uh, we will have a pinch of uh, fiscal dominance applied to central banks, especially the ECB, in order to finance this renaissance of the European state uh, and, and, and more debt. But in this context, and, and, and before discussing the, the, the economic uh, uh, dimension of, of what's going on, uh, I would bring up two issues, two questions uh, in, in terms of introductory uh, remarks. Um, perhaps the first question is why we are moving towards more state intervention in Europe. Is the current public health crisis the reason? I'm not sure. I believe that COVID served as a catalyst to more state intervention in the EU economy, uh, but this is, this is not the main cause. Um, some subtle political changes in Brussels, Paris, and Berlin predate COVID. I think in particular about the conversion of Berlin, at least uh, of the German economic ministry, to the merits of a pan-European industrial policy, so some kind of pan-European uh, Colbertism, and the critics also address to the EU competition policy hindering strategic measures inside Europe. COVID, the COVID crisis also offered the European Green Deal, uh, Ursula von der Leyen's political agenda, uh, a, a, a 750 billion funding scheme that will revive public investment and elegantly allow to bypass the mass rich criteria. Um, I think that the underlying reason of the conversion of, of, of Europe to more state interventionism posted mixed results in the past. So um, Europe has a lot of the technological battle to the US and to China, uh, and Europe needed a wake-up call to avoid losing the geopolitical battle. So we should not forget the historical dimension of for present. We are living this uh, what Karl Polyani uh, uh, described as double movement of hyperglobalization spread in global markets that raise the need to more regulation, more guidance, more protection at the local level, the state. I would not speak about isolation, but um, the hyperglobalization is perhaps a common factor behind Brexit. Mm and the current transformation uh, we, we are seeing uh, or we are talking about in terms of European uh, 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 political economy. My, my second point, um, another question might be what kind of state interventionism uh, we will see in, in Europe. Uh, are we talking about, and this is something that, that Julie uh, touched uh, upon, but are we talking about more interventionism at the level of the member states, at the level of the European institutions, or at both levels in a coordinated way? Um, the European Recovery Fund uh, seems to open the way to much more coordination. And um, I remember that less than two decades ago, uh, political scientists were describing the European Union by means of the famous principal agent model. Democratic elected member states were the principal uh, that delegated some unpleasant tasks to the EU as an agent. Uh, with the Green Deal, we, the conditionality linked to the European recovery grants I would argue that this dual role is vanishing. The European Union has become much more than a delegate agent of the member states in the past few months. Um, this raises, of course, the question of the democratic accountability of European institutions. Another debate I would not open now, but it probably paves the way to further integration, a new treaty and a new kind of political economy. Uh, the simple fact uh, that 27 sovereign states decided to borrow money together over 30 years without explicit fiscal federalism 
strengthen my view that the European integration is a sui generis process uh, that goes much beyond the framework of, of, economic, of economic theory. And you can no more uh, analyze uh, the European Union and the European Monetary Union by means of, of optimal currency areas or, or, or something, uh, something like that. But let me stop there uh, to, to leave the room for, for the discussion. Thank you very much. So it's fascinating and some really interesting points to, uh, to follow up on. Um, I think one of the things that I was wondering, um, and be before I go into that, I should uh, remind everyone again to please uh, put any and all questions into the Q&A box um, so we can really get the discussion going. Um, and yes, let us know whether um, you want to ask them live as well. Um, but yeah, to, to come back to one of the points that I thought was really interesting with uh, Savanya, the point that you made about really a lot of this shift and particularly the shift in certain ways from uh, from the market to the state, so to say, uh, predating uh, COVID and then particularly looking at, for instance, competition policy. That really reminds me of the case uh, last year now uh, when uh, France and Germany were hoping to push for a merger for uh, Siemens and Alstom, the uh, train manufacturers. However, this did run up into the European Commission, which uh, said, well, that doesn't comply with uh, with the European competition rules. And they basically torpedoed that. That was then led to the response from France and Germany, but that hasn't really gone anywhere yet. And I think that was one of the things that uh, really prompted us to to think about this a bit uh, when we uh, in the Europe program we wrote our paper in that a lot of the um, EU uh, structures and rules that we have at the moment are really in a certain way about constraining the power of the state to intervene in the markets uh, which led us to the question is such a shift in uh, the perception of the right balance between the state and the market is it actually compat compatible with um, with the current EU as as we have, and you mentioned, well, we might be working towards a new treaty, but of course, every time that comes up, there will be someone in the room who says, well, it's going to be impossible to agree to a new treaty, um, given all the different splits that we have within the EU. So I was really curious to hear from both of you what you think in terms of, is such a shift, is that compatible with uh, the kind of EU that we have now and the kind of rules um, and EU laws that we have now and the kind of treaties really, um, that the EU is built on at the moment. So I'll let, uh, yeah, sorry, Savan, uh, I'll let you go first. Oh, oh, Julie, if you want to start. No, okay. No, this is, ex um, this is exactly what's happening. So um, right now, this kind of discussion of, of semantic uh, shift of uh, in, in, inside Europe, Maybe the Brexit uh, is also a reason for uh, for this uh, shift inside uh, or the shift in debate inside Europe. But uh, the European competition policy um, corresponds uh, or is or coincides, I would say, with the German doctrine of order liberalism. Um, you need to protect the market participants from the state power by ensuring competi full competition or optimal competition. And this optimal competition is seen through the lens of the market structure, the size of uh, the, 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 the market participants. It's a neoclassical view on the uh, competition, on the market uh, structure, which is a bit old fashioned. Uh, if you <laughs> uh, uh, read some, uh, some, some, uh, some famous economists, for instance, like, uh, like Hayek, um, but it's still the, it, it was still the, 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 the institution uh, we had in, in Europe. And with the um, rise of China, which is not coping with an order liberal view on competition policy, um, there has been some yeah, uh, discussion in, in Europe still going on, but also in, uh, in, in, in Germany, uh, uh, in Berlin, um, asking whether this auto liberal view of auto liberal organization of uh, of the uh, competition policy is still optimal, uh, because the, uh, the 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 risk is for Europe 
not only to risk the, to, 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 to lose the technological battle, but to lose the battle at all. Um, you know, increasingly bipolar world. So maybe, and, and remember also, once again, in term, I think we, we, we should really um, consider the, the, the historical dimension of what we are living. Uh, think about uh, the, 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 the French way of thinking about industrial policy opposed to uh, the neoliberal or the liberal competition policy. Um, the, the Colbertism, uh, the French classic Colbertism, which aimed at raising national champions uh, raising the potential of the industrial potential of an economy was a doctrine of a time uh, where the French uh, crown was trying to, uh, to, to, to dominate uh, the rest of Europe. Um, so maybe the ordo liberal and even, even, uh, even, the, <laughs> even Walter Eucken uh, uh, wrote that, uh, the good father of the Odo, German ordo liberalism, but each theory is uh, the, um, the child of his uh, historic development. And although liberalism was probably the right answer after the Second World War in order to keep the state power distant from the markets, but the rise of China is a game changer in terms of economic policy for Europe. The, oh, that's interesting. So it's more China than actually COVID uh, that you think has been the driver. You, you always need a crisis to catalyze some transformation. And the COVID is probably, Brexit is one of them, the COVID is one of them. And as Trudy mentioned, also the past crisis uh, that the Eurozone and the EU uh, experienced in 2012 and 2015 are also catalysts of, of the current transformation you see. Uh, do, you, do you think that the sort of the political um, winds uh, within the EU are favourable to this, or because um, as I said, um, this would probably require a treaty change at some point, which we all know. Um, there's a reason why that hasn't been tried for over a decade now. So, one of the impediments to treaty change has left the European Union. And of course, that was one of the reasons David Cameron was so opposed to having the Fiscal Compact Treaty as an EU treaty, was because he didn't want to have to have the referendum to ratify it, which we would have had to do under the Europe, EU Act 2011. So the absence of the United Kingdom, in some ways, makes treaty change more possible. But we have got, and we've talked a lot about France and Germany, we haven't really talked about Central and Eastern Europe. And one of the things that's noticeable in terms of solidarity, the ECFR's solidarity tracker has various activities that Hungary's done, but actually they're things like opening the borders to Bulgarians coming home, sort of essentially trying to get out of quarantine or whatever. They're not necessarily longer term changes. And I think we are likely to see some real tensions between some of the Central and East European countries on the one hand and the UK, sorry, and France and Germany on the other. So at the moment, you've got some countries that really would be supportive of deeper integration. The way around it might be to do what was done with the fiscal compact, which would be to have an international treaty. It's not ideal, but it's the way around it because you don't necessarily have to have all the member states and the ratification process can be easier. So it's not something that if I were advising either the governments in France or Germany or I were chef de cabinet to von der Leyen or any of the commissioners, but it might be a way around. Okay, so more the, uh, the Euro crisis strategy uh, again. Might have to be. Yes. Um, and we'll move on to uh, to the question from the audience. Again, uh, please everyone just uh, throw your questions into the, uh, the Q&A box. Um, we have a first question from uh, David Henry Doyle. And I think someone will open up uh, the microphone for you if you want to, um, to ask that question to the panelists. Sure, yeah, thank you. Thank you um, very much. Um, Hi Sylvain, hi Julie. Uh, I know both of you from, from a previous life as a, as a student of Julie and as a colleague of Sylvain, so great to see you together on this, on this platform. My question was really about um, 
The plans to internationalize the euro, this is something that the European Commission has, has um, trotted out a number of times over the last year, year and a half, and, and really stems from, I think, the failure of the Iran nuclear deal and the, the dominance of the dollar in international commodity and capital markets. So my, my real question was, do you think it's sort of a realistic tool to, to give the EU more clout and autonomy in the, in the international geopolitical order to sort of use the euro as a weapon? Or is, is this sort of more um, sort of imaginative, um, creative narrative from the EU that, that they don't have a lot of hard tools in, in, in geopolitical terms? So let's talk up the euro while the dollar is, uh, is sort of you know, perhaps reaching a, a hiatus as, a, as, as, a, as an instrument of uh, global policy. So I was very curious you know, what you think of this proposal and if you, you believe that other geopolitical tools might be more um, suitable. I notice you don't mention sterling at all. It's the dollar or the euro. Um, and I think, in, again, there's a way in which the euro has gained strength in recent months. And there is clearly an opportunity for the euro to play an important role. The question, though, is how far the European Union can really set a policy. Is it going to be setting parameters for the ECB? how far is it is that actually going to give any leverage i'm not wholly sure i think there are other ways in which the european union could do more which would be a lot more about speaking with one voice on international issues and yes the the iran deal has hit a wall but it hasn't hit a wall because of european failures it's hit a wall because the united states decided it wasn't fit for purpose and i think one of the things that the EU27 needs to think about, perhaps with the United Kingdom um, as a close neighbour, is how far it needs to develop its own international policy that will be crucial if the United States is going to be led, perhaps for another four years, by Donald Trump, whose interests and approach are really very different from those of Europe and whose values are quite different from the values that underpin the European project. Now, you, you touch upon a, 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 a very great point, uh, uh, David. Mm. Uh, so on, the internationalization of the euro is another political shift we have had in the European Union, which predates COVID. It's related probably uh, partly to uh, the behavior of the US administration um, we have had. And remember, we have uh, one letter sent by the European uh, Commission president um, in December 2018, uh, making the internationalization of the euro an objective, a political objective of the European Union. And this was at that time something completely new. Maybe people um, are, are, are seeing the, the European Recovery Fund as a game changer, but a letter of the president of the European Commission saying, I want to international the, 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 the euro was already a, a political shift. I remember that the Bundesbank always or no, never wanted to internationalize the, the role of the Deutsche Mark. Uh, because of what it means. And what does it mean to internationalize uh, a currency? It's the privilege of the, of the dollar. It, it needs, you, you need to run a large current account deficits. And it's much easier for the US to do that than for the Eurozone, um, especially with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Germany being uh, 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 the uh, uh, exporter number one worldwide. So this is a shift. And in some point, uh, the European economy is already enjoying the privilege of having an international currency. And I come back on, on that. But on the other side, it will be almost impossible in the foreseeable future to uh, challenge the role of the dollar and, uh, 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 independently of the, of the uh, uh, results of the US elections. Um, this is because of the financing 
uh, channels uh, and 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 uh, we and system we have in in Europe. If you look at the uh, uh, the euro makes something a, a, a bit more than 20% of the uh, world uh, FX uh, uh, um, um, uh, reserves. Uh, but in terms of debt issuance, it's still very small. The only point uh, or, uh, uh, where the euro uh, is, is, is winning a bit more in terms of international role is the uh, international lending. And this is due to the fact that interest rates in the eurozone are so low that the euro has become uh, a carry trade currency like the yen in the 90s. So this is not exactly what I would say a success in terms of internationalization of the euro. Having said that, you, what you see is that many European corporates have discovered the benefits of the euro as an international currency with very low interest rates to do exactly what US companies did in the 80s, namely to invest massively abroad by lending at home at very uh, low interest rates and, uh, and investing abroad uh, in the US, in Asia, uh, in Europe, outside the Eurozone. And this is exactly uh, the strategy um, described by Ellen Ray uh, as a venture capitalist. Uh, the euro uh, made uh, more risky investment abroad possible, meaning it, ma it makes it's making the um, financing, the external financing of the European uh, economies easier uh, than than before. So, no, no, no uh, big development in terms of internationalization, and I, I think it will keep like that. But still, the European economy is benefiting from uh, from the euro a lot. That's really uh, that's really interesting, and I've I have a, a follow up question to that, in particularly around the point of what it requires to have an international um, reserve currency, basically, which is you also need to be issuing basically debt for everyone to keep their reserves in, um, and something that the U.S. clearly is willing to do, but that historically, particularly the largest eurozone economy, is very much unwilling to do, and that has actually been doing the opposite in recent years, and the rich surpluses been removing debt from the market. In the, especially in the last couple of months, of course, we've seen quite a shift in, in that, of course, necessitated by the current crisis. Uh, Germany let go of its uh, Schwarze Null, its, its black zero policy of balanced budgets. Um, is the European Commission won't be mo uh, enforcing the fiscal compact and won't be enforcing the fiscal rules within the eurozone so basically every country is going to be running deficits of around 10 percent of gdp so i'm very curious to hear whether you think that is a more permanent shift in terms of fiscal policy not just around the kind of deficits to run but also how fiscal policy gets used not just on the european level where we have the recovery fund but also on the national level so will we see this becoming slightly more permanent or do you and i guess this goes for both of you um do you expect, particularly a country like Germany, to basically revert to form in two years' time and uh, start aiming for surpluses again? So I'll throw that over to uh, Julie first. Well, I think one of the issues is precisely at the moment, interest rates are so low that having deficits isn't necessarily as catastrophic as at times when you're going to have much higher interest rates and so there there is a question of you know, what's the cost of money and what's the cost of borrowing um but ultimately it's going to depend on the political situation as much as the economic i think that whether these are permanent changes or temporary will to a large extent depend on what the electors are saying in the next elections in each of the member states. And it's not going to be overturned by elections to the European Parliament, it's going to be elections in the member states. And if Sylvan is right, and I think he is, that some of these changes have begun to come about before the COVID crisis, which has maybe acted as a catalyst, then maybe we are seeing some shift away from a neoliberal order to something that's more social democratic, where the role of the state is more important. And if that is the case, then that is potentially the time when we could also be looking for the sort of economic levers at a European level that you really need if the Eurozone 
is going to be stable because at the moment we still don't have those automatic fiscal stabilizers or the political union that you need in order to make the eurozone internally coherent and maybe this is the time for that change yeah let me put it that way uh, a good family father does not only repay his debt for his children he invests mm -hmm. in the family capital and that's what the european continental europe did too less in the past. Mm -hmm. um, mm. The British taxpayers are happy citizens in terms of public investment fueled from the from the continent. Uh, I, 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 I've seen uh, many uh, uh, many reportages on the British TV channel uh, with people complaining about too few public investments uh, in in the UK. Hey, come on the continent. That's worth. Um, there is a one percentage point gap of pub net public investment between the, the UK and a big Eurozone country for now almost a decade. Mm -hmm. That means that the European, the continental European states are not investing enough in the future generation. And, that's a, and, and what's the problem? What's the difference to the UK? This is budget rules. In the UK, you have uh, the so-called golden rules, uh, golden rule for public investment that mm. take the public investment uh, uh, outside accounting for uh, for debt consolidation and, and 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 budget consolidation. And um, this is a point that has been acknowledged by the uh, European Fiscal Board, uh, which uh, published a report last year, also predating COVID. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on uh, the uh, efficiency of the European budget rule. And this report said, oh, sorry, very clear, saying, well, the Maastricht criteria are not very efficient. Mm -hmm. You cannot, uh, you cannot ha maintain three percentage points uh, total deficit uh, in order to keep the public debt ratio stable at 60% in a world uh, in which you have no almost zero inflation and much less potential growth uh, than at time of mass -rich. That's simply just debt accounting. Uh, and uh, look at the situation in Germany, look at the situation in Italy, in Spain, but France is also becoming uh, uh, much of the same. Public investment is in net term so once you take uh, uh, account of the depreciation of public infrastructures, uh, has been zero or even negative. You, you do not invest in the next generations. So, and this overall uh, of the European budget rules would have been discussed by the summer if we did not have the COVID crisis. Now, um, by chance, we have, uh, or by chance, I don't know, I would not say that, but um, the recession is so deep that uh, the uh, European fiscal rules have been uh, suspended, uh, leaving time for the European Commission and Parliament to think about how to overall uh, the budget rules to make them intelligent, to allow like the, the, the British government can do to allow the European states to invest more, what, we, what is the only way to uh, raise potential GDP uh, if you spend the money uh, in a smart way. So yes, this is also in the pipeline. So the, 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 uh, an overall uh, uh, of, of the uh, European budget rule is in the pipeline. Politically speaking, you cannot uh, cancel Maastricht because this is one of the very few points of the European integration for which you ask European citizens to vote. <laughs> um, so the, the, the democratic accountability of Maastricht is bigger than uh, the uh, report of the fiscal board. That's, uh, that's clear. Um, but yeah, you, you need to, uh, you need to, 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 to bring, uh, to allow more public investment in, 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 on the continent. And the European next gen plan is a way to do that, bypassing the, the budget rules, but it's not enough. You need to address the question of the budget rules. Yes. Yeah. As a, as a Dutchman, um, I'm very 
very aware of uh, the political power of the Maastricht uh, criteria and uh, how difficult it would be to get at least my government to agree to, to let them go. Um, I think one really interesting thing that you mentioned, uh, Julie, was that a lot of this is about effectively what happens sort of on an electoral level um, in Europe and whether you'll see the kind of um, the kind of shifts there that would actually open up the political space to do this. Um, and we actually had a, one, a question in that direction from uh, Samuel Wilkin. So it just uh, opened it up to him uh, to ask that question. And if he could also just tell us your affiliation uh, quickly as well. Okay. And it's, ah, yes. It's uh, David Simmons. I'm uh, retired and just recently ah. joined uh, uh, Chatham House as an associate member. So it's my first uh, webinar. So thank you for uh, for having me, let me uh, give a question, and thanks for the uh, for the for the two talks. Uh, my question was: um, Will the uh, COVID response facilitate or delay the EU's objectives for decarbonisation to meet its climate change goals? I would like to come in, uh, Julie. Would you like to say uh, something about that? I think potentially the European Union could take this as the opportunity to say. Yeah, we're going to invest. It's important to invest for the future, exactly as Sylvan is saying, you need to think about future generations. But the way to do that is through green investment rather than further investment in dirty coal. And I think if the agenda is being set by von der Leyen, for example, then we're going to see something which is greener and more forward-looking than perhaps if we had a Polish president of the commission who might be saying, well, actually my country's got a different perspective. So I think it is an opportunity, or could be an opportunity. Same answer from my side. I think the, the, the COVID will facilitate uh, the uh, decarbonisation of the European economy in, in the way that the EU Green Deal as we see, uh, receive a, a, a massive funding mm -hmm. uh, from from the member states, agreed even from 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 the north of Europe, um, the, and this will have not, it will have been much more difficult for Ursula von der Leyen to convince the 27 states uh, to 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 finance the investments we need to uh, to implement the Green Deal and to to make it happen. So. From the financing point of view, yes, the COVID uh, is a, a facilitator of the of the green and digital transition. Uh, from the uh, investment point of view, I don't know. Uh, I mean, is it techni technically feasible to dec decarbonize the European economy at the pace that has been set by the by Ursula von der Leyen? I'm just an economist. I, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> But at least, yes, uh, it, it's a facilitator. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David, for that question. Welcome to, to Chatham House. Um, and we'll move on to uh, Sammy Wilkin uh, for, for his question. <laughs> okay, th thank you. And um, I liked David's question as well. <laughs> um, the uh, question I wanted to ask was about populism. Everyone traditionally, uh, I'm from Willis Towers Watson, uh, I think I said. Um, uh, the question I wanted to ask about populism, everyone traditionally worries about Italy, or unless we should be worried about someone else. And uh, about authoritarians within the EU, um, I think everyone traditionally worries about Hungary and Poland, although it would be interesting if any, we should be worried about anyone else. So uh, you want to start? You want to start on that? Yeah, who should we be, we be worried about? Um, okay, um, it's 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 difficult to say, but um, what I what I think is that with the with grants, three hundred ninety billion of grants. Um, if you look at the whole package, the European Union uh, is is. Uh, offering to the member states uh, made of grants and loans. Something like 30% will go to Italy, a bit more than a quarter will go to Spain, 10% will go to Poland from the support, from the EU support. The net benefits are something different. Um, and for the first time in, in the history of the EU, the EU will try to uh, intensifize the uh, country, the member states, to fulfill its political goals, the Green Deal, the digital transition, with a carrot, 
grants and not with a button, the, uh, uh, the mastery criteria. Um, it's a huge difference that at some point, if uh, the uh, European recovery plan succeeds um, in terms of, 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 of uh, public investment, uh, increasing put, uh, uh, GDP per capita and so on, uh, then at some point you should see voters a bit more uh, 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 happy to have uh, or to live within the European Union. But that's the rational, or that's a rational uh, 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 argumentation uh, that an economist can have. Uh, politics is something different. I leave it to Julie. I I'm going to start with something which might, in a Chatham House context, sound a little bit surprising, and even more surprising from somebody whose political affiliation is as a Liberal Democrat in the United Kingdom. But I notice the language we're tending to use is, who should we be worried about? Should we be worried about the populists? Should we be worried about the authoritarians? And I think one of the things that it's really important to think about is what messages, what signals do politicians give out to voters? And do voters feel they're being listened to? And I was picked up in a seminar a few years ago by an academic because I clearly expressed my personal views, my concern about anti-immigration parties. And I was basically put back in my box and told that actually it was a very elitist opinion that I had just articulated because if people wanted to vote for anti-immigration parties in a democracy, that was their choice. And I think one of the things that we need to think about is you know, what messages are being sent by politicians and how far do politicians actually seem to be willing and able to deliver what citizens need. And I think the economic, the rational economic response that Sylvain has given is absolutely right, that if there are clearly economic benefits coming from membership of the European Union, then I think it's much easier to say to voters, well, look, this, this place, you know, we're, we're benefiting. There are tangible benefits. And if you can see tangible benefits, you can persuade people who might be minded to vote for a Eurosceptic or a populist party. But the more that we have the sticks, the more that we have the conditionality and the sense of, are we going to sanction countries for the way they behave? The danger then is that you create some sort of martyr so that Viktor Orban will say, but look how they're treating me. You know, Hungary is a proud country and we're being treated badly. And then that creates even more support for him rather than less. And so the, that balance of sticks and carrots, of being able to persuade the member states and their voters of the liberal democratic human rights values that have been enshrined by the European Union is quite a difficult balancing act. Some of it's about the economic outcomes, but some of it also needs to be about persuasion. I think that uh, we still have three minutes. I'm just gonna ask like, one very quick final uh, question. Because um, looking back um, over the, sort of the last six, seven months and the way that the political winds have, have changed in that, in that time, we sort of initially saw a bit of a rally around the flag effect, um, at least sort of in the political polls, where whoever was in charge, whoever was in government saw a large boost in, uh, in support and in a lot of countries the populist parties did uh, quite badly um, suggesting that any sort of competent management for instance of both the economy and really the, the health aspect really boosted um, boosted let's say the, the mainstream parties. Uh, so I'm quite curious whether um, and this also harps back I think to the to the main topic that we've been discussing in terms of shifts in political economy balance between the state and the market whether actually after what will have been at least a year of uh, the, the government or the state um, controlling the economy through, uh, through lockdowns, but also controlling people's uh, social lives, their work lives in a very negative context, even though this has had very positive 
benefits in terms of health and economic outcomes that we that we might actually get a swing the other way that actually we might see a massive boost for the populace particularly in a context where if we're relying on the european recovery fund you know the money for that doesn't start flowing until early next year before we see any sort of impact of that we will be a few years down the line so i'm quite curious to hear what you think about actually this might be good for uh, the populace, um, even if at the moment they seem to be struggling a bit. Shall I come in? I mean, I think the, the one word I would use is competence, that if the incumbent governments appear to get a balance of good health outcomes without completely trashing the economies, where if borrowing, if deficit spending is leading to investment, is supporting jobs, then maybe the mainstream parties can persist and thrive. But the more incompetent a government is, then I think the more the challenges are going to come, possibly from the extremes, but it, it depends on who is the incumbent government. One, uh, one uh, um, explicit variable that explains uh, populist votes uh, across Europe is um, negatively correlated to confidence and unemployment. The unemployment rate is probably the, uh, at least for my country, this is, uh, this is the case, um, unemployment rate is the main reason for populist votes. And um, now that in this crisis, so almost all European states jumped on these follow-up schemes to avoid massive increase in unemployment rate. And my guess is that this many, in most countries, these follow schemes will be extended to the point that the economy uh, can be uh, left on standalone basis. Um, you will probably have noticed that the German government decided to extend the short-term working schemes to after the general election. <laughs> A little bit there. Yes, so it's a slightly worrying thought uh, for us in the UK, given that the government here is talking about winding it down uh, by October. Um, but I'll leave everyone to draw their own conclusions from that. Uh, thank you, uh, Julia and Savan, for a really interesting discussion. Um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us and for asking some great questions. I think this was part of a, a series which uh, the corporate uh, team put on for us uh, I think every two weeks, so there'll be another one soon. Um, and that just leaves me to wish you all a very good evening.